on to get started, and I'm so glad you could all join us this afternoon for strategies for preventing substance misuse in older adults with Chuck Clubgard. This presentation was prepared for the Great Lakes and Northwest Regional PTTCs under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. The opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services. The PTTC believes that words matter and uses affirming language in all our activities. A few housekeeping items to share with you. If you have technical issues, please individually message me, Rebecca Buller, or Chris Gabrielson in the chat section at the bottom of your screen, and we will be happy to assist you. If captions or live transcript would be helpful, please use your Zoom toolbar to enable by selecting live transcript. <clears throat> As far as AI note taker options, we do not, please do not activate an AI note taker application. We do not allow this for several reasons and we'll ask you to disengage. If you do not, we will remove you from the Zoom room. Questions for our speakers should be put in the Q&A section also at the bottom of your screen. This helps us not lose that question as the chat scrolls by, so please be sure to use that Q&A section. And you'll be directed to a short survey link at the completion of this webinar. And we'd appreciate it if you would fill it out. It takes about three minutes, helps us improve our offerings and report to our funders. Finally, certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended the webinar in full. And it can take up to two weeks to receive those certificates. And now I wanna introduce our presenter. Chuck Clivegard is a nationally recognized expert in substance misuse prevention, public health, and school-based health. Drawing on his experience in collective impact and prevention-focused partnerships, he builds the capacity of states, tribes, schools, communities, and cities to use evidence-based substance misuse prevention and intervention strategies. And here you go. All right, thank you, Rebecca. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, as we get started, I'm excited to be back with you all. We've, we've sort of looked at this issue and this topic uh, here in the Great Lakes region before, and we're thrilled to kind of have another opportunity to, to do a deeper dive in, into these issues of working with this population uh, of older adults. Uh, some of what we're going to do today is look at some ways to identify and assess the prevention needs of older adults in your community. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about community strategies to prevent misuse and promote the health and well-being of seniors. We're going to spend a, a, a little bit of time on the front end talking about why health and well-being are so linked to, uh, to risk behaviors, which often in prevention we target uh, sort of risky behaviors as, as a way of thinking about prevention, whereas I think we're we're learning a great deal about more effective ways of thinking about well-being and health as being uh, an entry point to deal with, with behaviors. Um, so we're going to look at some approaches and barriers or what we might think of as facilitators and barriers, if you're used to that language, about some important things to consider um, in being effective with, with uh, a population of older adults, some ways to make it easier and, and uh, reducing barriers for participation in prevention and wellness initiatives. Um, we're going to talk about new partnerships working across sectors um, and the important ways that that can happen. Um, so I'll do some setting the stage and some reminders about some of the numbers. We, we know that, that as, a, as a society here in the United States, we are, we are a growing older population. So the proportion of us that are 65 and older uh, within the end of this year, I will be in that 65 and older group. I am 64 this year. Um, so know that, that we're in that sort of largest uh, sort of generation that are moving into this age group. Um, so uh, one of the important factors of thinking about prevention work that we do is that this is there's more of us uh, to, to be involved in our communities. Um, certainly, we, we know substance use disorders among older folks are, are increasing uh, and that there's high risk for alcohol and other drug use. And we'll talk a little bit about some of what we know about that issue. Um, 
again, sort of understanding that there are uh, behaviors within this generation that drove some of that. Uh, there are certainly some, some issues with regard to the changes societally, some things that were brought in by the pandemic that, that increased and made worse circumstances around social isolation, as well as growing sort of uh, concern around uh, mental health issues uh, in, in a general sense that, that then compound issues with substance use disorders. Um, so lots of sort of a, one of the more alarming trends that I find concerning is, is the increase in, in death rates in this population of 65 and older, um, going from 6.9 to 9.9 .9 per 100,000 and just comparing these last chunks of years. So 216 to 218 compared to 2019 to 2021, a significant increase in, in the rate of death. Some of that driven by suicide uh, and, and other behavioral health uh, related issues, as well as overdose certainly drives that, as we know from other webinars that we've been on together, that, that this population is not exempt from uh, the opioid, fentanyl, and other uh, drug-related overdose crisis that's happened. Um, we also have seen an increase in, in depression in this population uh, along the way. Since 2011, that's been increasing. Um, so those, again, some quick reminders about some issues that drive this issue. I want to start uh, today by, by opening a poll and talk about a number of issues um, that I think I think of as a fact or falsehood kind of a piece. I think it's an important way to set the stage as you talk with folks in your organization, your community, your agency, some ways of putting some issues or setting some of the issues straight. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Rebecca to bring up our poll. And you'll see on your poll that in your window that you, there's a little scroll bar to the right and you can answer the questions and scroll up and down uh, in this window. So again, we're looking for um, depression and loneliness are normal uh, in older adults. The older I get, the less sleep I need. C is uh, older adults can't learn new things. D is it's inevitable uh, that older po folks get dementia. And finally, E, Older adults should take it easy and avoid exercise so they don't get injured. So fact or falsehood, fact or fiction in this case, take a minute and fill out the poll. All right, Rebecca, seeing that lots of folks have weighed in here, see, we can go ahead and post responses and I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Uh, depression and loneliness are, are normal in older adults. Um, it, not correct. So that's that's thought of by, by most uh, sort of folks who work in the field as, as really a falsehood uh, that, that in fact, depression is not a normal part of growing older. And what I said a moment ago is, is that sort of that, that many folks uh, in, in my age group are at greater risk for isolation and that that can lead to depression, but that it's not a normal part of developmental stage of getting older. In fact, what we know from from research is that, that younger folks are actually more likely to report depression than older folks. Uh, so people who are young and young adults uh, in general um, are at greater risk to experience depression in terms of the numbers. Um, the older I get, the, the less sleep I need. I, I think, again, this feels like a, a, a something that, that lots of folks will report that they don't get as much sleep, but it doesn't mean they don't need as much sleep. Um, when you're in, in this age group, as I am, I, I have a harder time falling asleep and staying asleep than I used to. Um, so it's rare that I get a solid eight hours of, of uninterrupted sleep. Um, but in fact, I still need that eight to nine hours of sleep. It's just more likely that, that I don't sleep as well and that I have more difficulty falling and staying asleep. Uh, so, and again, we know that sleep and insomnia relates to well-being as well as how I feel about myself the next day and that that then can lead to how well I take care of myself. If I didn't sleep well, I'm far less likely to get up and eat a good breakfast and go for a walk. So you hear there's lots of connections there that'll make even more sense when we get into the presentation uh, in a few minutes. It's it's inevitable that, that folks will develop dementia. Boy, I hope not. 
that that one's not true. Uh, again, we feel like uh, as we age, there's certainly a decline in what we would think of as some mild forgetfulness. I can tell you that I will, will set down my car key and within five minutes, I may not remember where I put it down. But in, so that part of, of mindful forgetfulness is probably normal part of decline, but dementia is not. In fact, lots of folks um, live well into their 80s and 90s and, and still are vital and able to, um, to, be, to be very involved and very sharp. Um, in that case, uh, older adults should take it easy and avoid exercise. Um, we, again, sort of can, can stay very active. Again, whether you want to, to do rigorous exercise is a different issue, but in terms of the more likely, um, the more that I take care of my physical activity, the more that is, again, that same interrelated activity that, that if I take good care of myself physically, I'm more likely to feel better. And if I feel better, I'm more likely to engage in healthy behaviors like eating better uh, and going for a walk uh, is, is part of and related to both my mood as well as uh, how I might engage in other healthy behaviors. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. We can close the poll. And again, some, some good thoughts to get people thinking about what we know uh, about working with older adults. I think in, in the field of prevention, we're, we're building and anchoring on what we understand about the way that we start and approach the work with risk and protective factors in mind. Remembering that risk factors are those things that increase the likelihood of use or misuse, um, that they're not causal relationships and that impact is exponential, meaning the more of them that I have, the, the more of these factors that I, that I have in my life, the more likely it, it is that I might misuse substances, get involved with, with at-risk behaviors or, or even develop a disorder. Uh, protective factors are conditions for healthy development. They can buffer risks. They're not the opposite of risk factors, but in fact, they are things that, that we think of as, again, um, sort of positive things that decrease the likelihood uh, that I might get involved in substance misuse, uh, non-medical use of prescription drugs, or again, get it, put myself at risk for, for disorders. So traditional kinds of risk factors for this population, you see a male affluent Caucasian are things that we think of as risk factors. Transitions, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, being widowed or single at, at this stage of life is something that, that presents risk, uh, a history of misuse coexisting medical conditions uh, are risk factors, isolation, loneliness, depression, or pain, as it represents chronic pain, especially is something that, again, presents risk uh, for this age group. Um, protective factors show up with, with lots of uh, good news in terms of positive affectivity, which we're going to talk about as a psychosocial factor in just a moment. Having positive connections, having a partner, um, again, sort of staying involved in relationships is, is protective um, in, this, in this body of research. A sense of purpose uh, is important. So again, as you transition into this stage of our lives, having that sense of purpose, so whether that's not my career anymore, but that there's still an important sort of uh, aspect of my life uh, that, that gives me a sense of purpose is still key as a protective factor. Life satisfaction, how happy am I am where, with where I am, what I'm doing, how my life went. Um, are all protective, moderate drinking. Uh, again, odd to see on a list of protective factors um, that we would see drinking, but we know again, sort of moderate drinking is associated as, as uh, protective in, with this population. Having health literacy, understanding um, and, and knowing a little bit about the, if I'm taking multiple prescriptions, how they might interact with one another, how, how use of alcohol may impact um, my use of, of, of medications, or generally some, some broader issues around maintaining my health. Uh, and positive coping skills, all protective factors. So I anchor us in those as a reminder to say that we're not saying that we should abandon health um, uh, approach to prevention by abandoning risk and protective factors. We wanna build on them with some language that might be new to some of us. So I'm gonna introduce a few more ways of thinking about prevention and, that we can integrate into our way of thinking called psychosocial factors. And again, sort of a bigger body of research uh, in terms of how we understand this population and the way that, that we can leverage uh, change in some new ways. So we think about health behaviors, both positive and negative. So, that, so negative health behaviors like smoking, drinking, not eating well, not exercising, positive health behaviors, engaging again in sort of social connections, taking better care of myself, eating well. So health behaviors are a major way that we think about the, the disease and longevity kinds of factors that happen in our lives. Leveraging psychosocial factors can play an important part in health behavior change. 
So, so what are they? Some, some basic ways of thinking about psychosocial factors. They're characteristics or facets that influence an individual psychologically or socially. So that hence the psychosocial piece is easier for, for me to remember if I think about it that way. So psychosocial resources in, in that same context would then mean uh, resources that are in my environment uh, that would include, for example, my social network, the level of social support that I have are, would all be things that we think of as psychosocial resources. Um, uh, the reason that they're important is, again, the sort of growing body of research and understanding around the importance, the relative importance of social network, emotional support and coping that go hand in hand together that actually have a, a very strong bearing on smoking and alcohol consumption, cannabis, non-medical use. So again, all of those sort of negative health behaviors uh, that we've been mentioning um, have a very strong association with, with social support, coping, affect, as well on the side of, on the negative side of psychosocial issues, feeling exhausted, hopeless or, hopeless or hostile um, are also things we can address that have a direct bearing on, on these health behaviors. So how do we integrate these together? I think about uh, coming, coming up with a model that, that creates a way of thinking about both of them together, thinking about risk and protective factors, and at the same time, considering psychosocial factors. Um, so we develop kind of a quick model that give you a sense about how to group them in a way so that you're hitting your bases of thinking about four ways of considering psychosocial factors along with risk and protective factors so that you're again sort of leveraging um, the, those, uh, those levers of change in some significant ways and creating some synergy almost uh, in that same way. So when we think about major life events on the far left here, um, at risk for major life events, a lot of folks think that, that retirement is a risk factor when in fact it's not. It's very complicated. So as we move in, life transitions themselves are considered risky from the way we understand risk factors in, in the context of substance misuse, but not necessarily with this population. So some key distinctions about risk for, for transitioning into older adulthood have to do with those transitions and whether they were planned or not, um, whether there's a loss of income. Uh, is one of those factors that impacts uh, a major life event that, that then could create a stressor that could lead to substance misuse. Um, whether I'm divorced or single or separated and still have a, an intact sort of social support system um, is, is considered a risk factor in this category of major life events. So similarly, on the protection side of things, on the so psychosocial part of it, um, if I'm secure, and, and security also meaning financially secure. I'm, I, this was planned. I have enough money. I have the right things around me. I'm in a secure environment. Um, I'm in a place that's safe. Um, all kinds of security uh, is a protective aspect. And again, that planned, the nature of it being a planned transition, I was ready for it. I wasn't forced into retirement. Um, and, and married is, is certainly considered protective. And again, it depends on the nature of the relationship, but it also more broadly having a, a strong supportive network that again, sort of a close relationship, an intimate relationship uh, could be considered protective in, as a major life event transition issue. Um, connectedness, similarly, some of the risks around connectedness uh, are easy to understand, social is isolation, which is different than loneliness. Loneliness also, um, it could be there. You could have, be connected to people and still feel lonely, or you can also be lonely and, and, and not necessarily have, have a lot of friends around. So they're, they're a little bit different from one another. Mobility is my own mobility. Can I get around? And that might mean, do I have physical constraints that, that, uh, prohibit me from being able to interact and, and to connect socially with people is, is, is one of the risk factors uh, in a psychosocial way that, that, that we think about. I can't be involved with people because I don't get around well. I don't have access to transportation. Maybe I live in a rural area or maybe I'm in a neighborhood that has no activity for someone um, for me to connect with that's my age or that, that has the kinds of activities I wanna engage in. On the positive side, having a social network having supportive relationships, uh, continued involvement in a broader sense. So having people in my life, but also having things to do, uh, having things that I'm connected with in the community, having regular routine that gets me out of the house could be a protective factor in connectedness. Um, finally, lots of, of um, understanding around well-being. We've talked about depression, but also cynicism, hopelessness, exhaustion are issues that, that impact well-being. 
uh, in some significant ways. We'll talk a moment about ageism as well in terms of anticipated um, sort of discrimination or, or prejudice about uh, growing older, or if I believe people will discriminate against me, or I or actually experience direct uh, impact of, of ageism by not being allowed or being treated differently because I'm older, um, are things that, that are considered risk factors um, for substance use in the psychosocial realm. Um, so positive affectivity on the positive side, having that sense of purpose, perceived self-efficacy are all key milestones of, of well-being. Uh, in this model. And then finally, looking at the relationships of health um, and, uh, as their connections here. So physiology, the changes that we have in growing older, we know that our tolerance to alcohol changes. The way that we, we metabolize substances, including prescriptions and, and, and drugs and alcohol change the way we metabolize. Our ability to heal and recover from damage that's done from drinking or drugs is different. So there's a whole bunch of physio physiology kinds of issues that change the way that we're involved, our ability to deal with how drugs interact. And so there's lots of them you're hearing. Insomnia as, as an issue, again, sort of having a direct relationship on a whole bunch of issues. Insomnia affects my health, my well-being, uh, all kinds of issues. So, so how well I'm sleeping uh, and how well I'm being able to get to sleep and stay asleep and get recuperative uh, sort of recovery is, is really key in the context of risk factors. En engagement in risky behaviors, and again, we know that those behaviors with this population travel together, meaning that if I smoke cigarettes, I'm also more likely to report that I'm less active, inactive and that I don't eat well. Um, so you're hearing that risky behaviors uh, sort of travels in groups and that they likely have impacts on, on, on how I feel about myself and, and what I do in terms of adaptive health behaviors. So adaptive health behaviors in that context, on the positive side, the more I take care of myself, the more I eat well, the more I'm active. Um, so those would be considered adaptive health behaviors on the positive side. Having health literacy, knowing how substances interact and knowing about the ways to stay healthy, knowing about how drugs interact with one another if I'm taking multiple prescriptions. Health literacy could be how, how alcohol might interact with, with a prescription that I'm taking, um, having positive health. Uh, all of these issues, again, sort of related to across this whole continuum of factors we talked about all relate to, to having a longer life. The more I feel good about myself, the more I take care of myself, obviously, and, and that maintaining a sense of positive affect all contribute to longevity having a longer life. So I want to say a couple things before I leave pro-social stuff to give you a sense about how they interact with each other. Um, this to me presented as a, as a preventionist, a really positive sort of way of thinking about, uh, about sort of factors in a new way. So thinking about positive affectivity as being one of the things we're going to talk a lot about today, um, it affects our physiology, meaning that the, the more I feel good about myself, you see a two-way relationship with supportive relationships, for example. If I feel good, I'm more likely to go out and interact with friends or, or to have supportive relationships that I'm activating um, in my life. And the more that I do that, the more that I go out and interact with people, the better I feel. Uh, about myself and, and my affect improves. So you see that sort of two-way relationship that happens there. The same thing happens with regard to positive affect and, and a, those adaptive be health, health behaviors. If I wake up and I've slept well and I feel good about myself, I'm, I'm feeling good today, my affect is up, I'm more likely to take that walk and eat well. Um, and similarly, if I force myself to go out on a walk, even though I didn't want to, um, and I come back, I, I feel better about myself and I feel better physically. And then I'm more likely to eat a healthy lunch. So you're hearing that two way street and I can say me and use myself as the example because I am in this group. Um, those are very true things for me. So knowing that, that this is valuable in, this, in the way that we think about points of intervention. So similarly, uh, you know, ageism, lo loneliness, and positive af affectivity. To give you a few more examples, we know that sort of um, perceived discrimination. If I feel like growing older is going to create this sort of neg negative uh, aspect of my life, that people will see me differently, and that I believe that I'm going to be treated differently, it, it impacts uh, my sense of, of how I interact with people, which could, could then lead to loneliness, um, could then also have a, a negative impact on positive affectivity for me. So we hear that sort of dealing directly with the with one issue um, is, is 
key, but it doesn't matter where we start. We want to deal with affect, but we also want to deal with ageism. So the point of entry of what comes first, the chicken or the egg here, doesn't matter. As it's in this relationship of psychosocial factors, because of how strongly they're related to each other, we can start in any place. We can deal with loneliness and also then deal with ageism. We can deal with ageism and end up impacting positive affectivity. So you're hearing those relationships are so... Uh, two-way and related with each other that, that the points of intervention are many uh, in that same way. Uh, lots of relationships with, with self-efficacy or self-esteem. Um, uh, in particular, sort of older men who smoke are more, more likely to report positive affects of smoking than, than women who smoke. In a sense, that's about that sort of self-efficacy issue. If I feel like I'm capable of, of quitting or not smoking, I'm more likely to uh, to get involved in, in some positive behaviors so that the how I feel about myself and my self-efficacy and my self-esteem have, have a relationship with risky behaviors in some similar kinds of ways. So finally, looking at supportive relationships, um, one of the sort of major themes in, in sort of looking at evidence-based approaches for working with older adult populations is to think about starting with building connectedness, building supportive relationships, because Building supportive relationships builds to a very direct relationship of increasing positive affect that has a direct relationship to increasing health literacy, meaning that, that there's a couple of studies that would point to if I have a strong supportive network of friends that I talk to, feel better about myself, I'm more likely to, to take prescriptions in the way that I'm supposed to take them. I'm, I'm less likely to, to, um, to not follow scripts and to get involved with, with non-medical use of prescriptions, for example. So all of this sort of supportive relationship triggers positive affect and increases the likelihood of health literacy that then leads to positive health. So you're seeing this kind of a string as making sense about why we think of levers as levers of change with this population of, of being in the middle here uh, as being looking at starting with connectedness and well-being. Um, so one more piece, and then I'm going to start our panel. I want to use some terminology, again, that we may be less familiar with. Uh, a lot of, of what we think of with working with population specific is that we think about barriers and facilitators, things that either uh, a barrier in this case today are things that hinder, limit, or prevent people from engaging in a certain behavior. And a facilitator in this case are factors that favor, facilitate, or help make it easier and make it more likely that people will engage in behaviors. So barriers are those things that would make it harder for older adults to participate in our wellness program. Facilitators are the things that make it easier or more likely that they'll participate in our program. Um, I organize them in a socio-ecological model because again, as, as an older adult, it's important for me to anchor things in what I know. So we'll start with thinking about what are barriers and facilitators or examples of them that show up in, in this socio-ecological level. So starting with, with individual, and we understand this in prevention, again, as being behavior, knowledge, those things at this level of the individual, some things that open doors in this case, you see the little green door opening, um, knowledge, awareness, positive attitudes, enjoyment or interest, a sense of achievement. Those would all be things that are important to keep in mind as you design programming for, for older adults. Again, or sort of positive attitudes, knowledge and awareness, enjoyment or interest, a sense of achievement. Um, sounds crazy weird. Um, you'll hear some of our presenters talk about the fact that they give achievements, they give certificates as being an, an incentive, a facilitator, it is real. Uh, having a sense of, of having done something, accomplished something is, is a key aspect of individual level facilitators. So um, barriers are those things like physical health conditions in this case, limitations, um, physical limitations, uh, lack of motivation, time or interest. There could be language barriers that show up in the literature as individual barriers with this population. So at the relationship level, again, this sort of family partner relationship stuff, um, family members, partners, and friends can all be facilitators. Um, in this research, it's clear that one of the, the important levers to engage this population is to engage their friend, to engage their daughter, uh, to engage their partner. Um, so those folks are the folks who can get them involved in the program. And they can also help motivate them. They can make sure that they get there. Um, so think about uh, that social network as being facilitators of involvement in programming. Uh, disharmonious uh, relationships can be that other side of that. If, they're, if they're, there aren't relationships, there's broken or strained relationships, those can potentially be barriers uh, at that level. 
Finally, community level stuff, like this will feel more familiar. Uh, thinking about uh, good weather, uh, would you launch a program for wellness in Chicago in February? Probably not. You'd have to give it some careful consideration. Uh, convenient and safe transportation can be an important facilitator, making it easier for people to get there, making it affordable and accessible in every way possible. Um, so thinking of barriers, again, lack of transportation, or simply not having knowledge or awareness of programs, remembering that, that this population is not as connected. Um, and again, we don't read newspapers and magazines the way we used to, and, and advertising for this event is not showing up on cable news. Um, so you have to think about awareness and knowledge of programs in, in some unique ways, because that's one of the more important sort of potential barriers uh, that has to be thought of in terms of how they get information we get information. At the policy level, this is again sort of the uh, development expansion of management activities as facilitators. Um, again, sort of you'll hear uh, folks on our panel talk about this issue of how to institutionalize this as change, building a line in your, in your staff to make uh, that there's a there's a person responsible to ensure that these programs show up, building it into your annual strategic plan that this population receives programs and services, uh, building it into your state plan in some respects. Uh, institutionalizing it is, is the issue. Organizational issues and duration of the program can act as barriers and how long is this? Uh, are there technology issues that are involved? So I wanna move into our panel so that you get a sense of, of hearing from the folks who are on the ground implementing programs. Um, each of our presenters today is going to talk about and mention a program uh, called WISE. This program, again, is, is uh, specifically designed to empower older adults to take responsibility for their own health, to make healthy lifestyle choices, to navigate the use of medications. Um, it is uh, the lever of change is largely based on, on that psychological well-being, knowledge and attitudes about aging. Uh, as well as uh, recognizing and addressing signs of depression. Uh, lots of outcomes um, that you'll hear some of these outcomes, but you'll hear others uh, on the panel talk about changes in knowledge and attitudes and healthcare behaviors and medication management, um, but a whole host of other psychosocial changes uh, start to happen when that synergy kicks in. So remember, if I deal with risk and protective factors and psychosocial factors together, there's a synergistic effect. It's two plus two equals eight. Uh, in that same respect. So our panel members today, we're excited to have three folks with us today. We have Pat Zuber-Wilson, the Associate Commissioner of Prevention, the Division of Prevention at the New York State Office of Addiction Services and Supports. We also have Valerie Leach with us today, who is the Prevention and Early Intervention Manager at the Office of Prevention, Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And finally, we have Gregory Morris with us today, who's a project coordinator of substance misuse prevention initiatives uh, at the Congregational Care Network at Indiana University Health. Um, so without further ado, each of these presenters, these panel members, are we're going to talk uh, for about 10 minutes or longer, um, and they're going to share with you lessons learned and what they're implementing, uh, ask you to hold your questions or post them in the pod, uh, so the Q&A pod, so we're going to have all three presenters present, and then we're going to take questions, so if you have a question uh, that's burning, go ahead and post it in that, in that Q&A pod, and so that we'll capture it and we'll, we'll get to you first, um, so without further ado, I will turn this over to our first presenter, Pat Zuber-Wilson. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm assuming it's afternoon for most of us, um, although there may be some um, people who it's good morning. Um, here at, in New York State, um, we built a relationship with our New York State Office for the Aging and our New York State Division of Veterans Affairs. Um, it was an important um, conversation that we were having about how do we address services for older adults. And as a result of those conversations, um, we developed a project um, to work with older adults throughout the state. I think it's important to point out that relationship between our Office of Aging and the Veterans Affairs. It was through their efforts to bring our local um, agencies, the local aging offices and veterans office to the table to work with our prevention system here in New York State. So we have nine prevention agencies, three in downstate New York, yes, New York City and Long Island and Westchester in that area, and five upstate. I know everybody thinks uh, New York is just 
one big New York City, but um, we have a very diverse um, uh, state. Um, so it included urban communities, um, suburban communities, rural communities, where there is great isolation. Um, we implemented the six session wellness initiative for senior education, which I will refer to for the rest of this um, presentation as WISE. And we paired WISE with screening brief intervention referral to treatment, ESPER. Thought it was very important to add that component into this model. Um, and we're really across New York State looking to expand ESPER throughout um, various ages, throughout various means um, beyond a healthcare setting. So it was important to, to bring that aspect to this project. Um, the implementation has only been about a year. And to our um, amazement, we have, our providers have seen over 1,700, uh, 1,074 older adults have gone through the WISE program um, in the first year of implementation, which is really amazing thing when you think about a, a time period of a year. And we've had 1,050 individuals screen for alcohol and substance use. Um, and some have received referrals um, to an assessment for treatment, but we've also had individuals who have just needed a brief intervention. And that's important to think about when we think about ESPERT. ESPERT is really about helping individuals before their substance use becomes of issue. Um, preliminary outcomes, increased perception of harm from alcohol use, prescription drug medication use, um, combined alcohol and prescription use. We've seen a decrease alcohol use among participants who did use, drink alcohol and 77% reported a change in behavior to promote healthy lifestyles. Next slide, please. And these are some of the results um, from this project. As you can see, what we have done is um, we have utilized pre and post tests to really get a handle on the changes that have been made in individual lives, becoming participants in the WISE program. I think really, this piece about better um, care of oneself is really important. As I heard Charles talk about that pro-social and risk and protective factors. Um, you know, we've seen changes in um, prescription, um, talking to your doctor about prescription use, use of medication, locking up medication, getting more exercise, setting a health goal for themselves. So this is really, um, been an amazing project for us in just the initial data that we have been able to gather from the program. Next slide, please. I see um, a note that says slides are too small to see the data. So I don't know if, if we can um, increase the slide sides. I know they're available um, through the link. Um, social connectedness, um, and I, I, I'm remiss. I have my colleague um, Ingrid Wurge here, who is really been in our team, um, one of the leaders in um, moving this project forward, um, and she works with us and the State Department of Health. So that con that connection um, with several agencies has really been very important. Um, what I will tell you beyond. Um, the data here is that individuals who participate in this program um, really come through this program. They want to do it again. They have connected with individuals that are in their communities. They have had an opportunity to really, um, you know, learn um, and build that social connectedness that we want to see with individuals that are older adults. Um, Ingrid, I'm going to say if you would like to um, unmute and add a couple of comments, I'm happy to have you do that before we go to the next slide. Yeah, I think I'm um, just building on what Pat was saying. It's not necessarily social connectedness isn't necessarily something that is measured in the pre and post test, but there 
are some indications that um, some of the changes that participants have made have included how they communicate about their health and wellness, how they talk to others about their um, you know, health-related and wellness-related goals, and um, just generally that folks are more focused on their wellness and better able to communicate about that to other people. So we pulled that out on this slide. Thank you, Ingrid. Next slide, please. So facilitators, um, this program has been well received by participants, facilitators, partners. Um, we have been serving, or we being our providers have been serving older adults in a range of programs, um, including um, nutrition programs, um, senior centers, libraries, churches, senior housing. Another point that has really just, um, I've heard from our provider system, is they have made connections within their community that they would have never made before implementing this program. And it's building stronger relationships within their local communities. Some of the challenges that we have had to address is, of course, data collection. And, and I know that for all of us, data collection is a challenge. Um, but um, we have been working through this, this program, which has really started as a pilot, um, developing a new collaborative infrastructure with a partner um, sites has taken some time. But once those partnerships are built and the collaboration is built, we see that this is going to be a program that can be expanded throughout the community, providing um, individual expert in a, in, in a group curriculum has been a challenge. Um, and each of our providers have really been working on how do we how do we do the expert screen? Do we do it at the onboarding process? Do we do it before the session around alcohol and substance use? And what do we do as follow-up? Um, so this has really been a challenge and we have uh, really been uh, working through that. And curriculum translation needs of the diverse um, communities that we have here in New York State um, has really been a challenge. Um, lesson learned that the partnership between our, our division and older adult agencies allows for effective delivery of substance use, misuse education to diverse populations um, statewide. I also want to add, I think part of this work has led to us being part of Governor Hochul's master plan for aging. Um, we are in the process right now across New York State of building a master plan for aging. And screening brief intervention has been part of it. The WISE project and the initial uh, reporting of this program, the master plan was part of the overall picture of, of the work that we're gonna be doing here in New York State. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that we have done here in New York State has been around coalition work and looking at coalition work a little bit differently than we do in the world of prevention. And that has been um, coalition work around special needs, special populations that um, are high, what we consider high need, and sometimes are not reached by um, our community coalition work. So we have established special population coalitions across the state. Um, ranging from everything from working with veterans to um, disengaged youth to LGBTQ plus community. But we also have three coalitions that are working with populations at the age of 50 plus. And uh, Charles, I'm 65 going on 66. So when I see 50 um, <laughs> as an older adult, it gives me a uh, pause uh, for cause, you know, cause for pause here. Um, but we are working with rural community, suburban and veterans. Um, and they are really looking at community level data, building prevention capacity and uh, implementing environmental strategies for population level change. And this is really just absolutely been a wonderful opportunity to really think about how do we reach older adults on a community-wide level um, around prevention? 
Um, we are measuring 30 day um, binge drinking, perceived risk of alcohol and binge drinking and community norms around um, binge drinking. Um, it's been a challenge. Um, challenge in engaging these communities. Um, data around risk and protective factors has always, is, as we know, um, our SPIF is is our, our North Star when it comes to coalition work and all of our prevention work, um, getting the data around risk and protective factors, and adapting youth-focused approaches for older adults. But we see this, again, as an important part of our work um, we are focusing not only on the individual, but as 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 Charles said, the community. So um, this, in a nutshell, is some of the things that we are doing here in New York State to address prevention around the older population. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, amazing. Uh, again, take a moment now. Post your questions in the Q and A pod uh, for Pat, and and so that we capture them there. You can put them in the chat. Use that Q and A pod uh, effectively. Uh, again, so thank you so much. Lots of questions. Uh, I'm guessing that that folks are going to have. Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, presentation. I'll turn it over to our next panel member, uh, Valerie. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you, New York. Um, it's tough to follow them because like they're the leaders in this. We learned from New York in this project um, early on. So, you know, during the pandemic, it brought to light so much of the gaps in our state for older adults. And we're very committed to this. And at the time we had heard what New York was doing. So we had had conversations. I don't know if Patricia remembers, we'd had conversations early on about what they're doing and how we wanted to take that model here in Ohio um, and adapt and adopt what works for us, um, which it's, it's been a wonderful, a wonderful experience. Um, I'm gonna echo much of what New York has shared in just the passion around this work and how this program is resonating across the state. Um, so not only did we want to take WISE and build it out, we also wanted to introduce SBIRT and then one step further and introduce QPR. Because, um, you know, our suicide rates here in the state for older adults are very terrifying right now. Um, so we want to do everything we can to wrap around our older adults um, across the state. So, you know, we talked about the aim of reducing substance use, suicide, and integrating those pieces, but we couldn't do that without some of our key local partners. Um, in Ohio, we had a small pocket of organizations in Southwest Ohio who had been using WISE for some time. Um, so we were able to lean in and partner with those organizations, including our Montgomery County Mental Health um, Recovery Services Board, who is the planning authority in that county in the state. Uh, St. Mary's Development Center, who is a provider of older adult services in that area. We also are working with the um, Dayton Urban Minority Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Outreach Program, who serves our urban communities in that space, um, as well as prevention awareness and support services. So these organizations were strong and wise and had been for some time. Um, so with their partnership, we've pulled together an advisory committee that has representatives from aging at the state level, local areas on aging, um, and other key partners to help us kind of lay this out. What's this going to look like? How are we going to train facilitators? Um, and it's been really great having these folks at the table with the knowledge already of the program. Um, we're also looking at how to further embed this work through our local community coalitions, like Patricia talked about in New York, um, because we see that relationship and those partnerships as a way to not only expand WISE, but it really opens up more pathways for other prevention programming to be offered. Um, some of our early wins, this curriculum sells itself. Like once it's implemented, the seniors absolutely love it. And the facilitators are reporting to us, they're having to turn people away because it's too full. Um, classes are filling up and they just can't have all, like everybody in one setting. Um, so it's, it's really a great response we're seeing. Um, it's also, it was an easy sell because providers want to offer more in this space. They want to do more for older adults, more than just alternative activities and peer directed programming. Um, so the high attendance has been great, 
but it's also an obstacle, right? Because they want to engage everyone, but capacity, it can be hard at times. Um, and again, this engagement is also leading to other opportunities for prevention efforts um, that's really creating more social supports and connections within the, the settings this is being implemented in. You know, one of our, our facilitators had talked about from this interaction, developing these relationships, they're hosting an adult prom in one of their senior living centers. And, you know, and it all came out of this work and getting in the door and building those relationships. Um, so it's really great to see this flourishing so early on. Um, Pat said they've only been in it a year. We've been planning for about a year and maybe have six months of implementation under our belt. So I think we're all seeing great results really early on. Um, next slide, please. So some of the initial outcomes, um, we have trained 55 new WISE facilitators across the state um, and really worked with the, our partners at NJPN to stand up a training of master trainers, which wasn't offered before. Um, so we currently have 14 master trainers in the state um, and 85 of all of those trainers have also been trained in QPR. So, you know, we're getting there and it's really important for us to have the capacity. And so we're so grateful that we were able to do the master trainer component of this. Um, to date, facilitators involved in this work um, have taught over 650 older adults in the curriculum, which is great in such a short period of time. And we're funding this through our state opioid response dollars. Um, it's allowed a lot of flexibility and innovation in how we um, are able to target other populations that maybe we can't with other funding. So that's been a great opportunity and, and something for folks to consider as well as a way to fund new initiatives such as this. Um, the data piece, um, again, that was a barrier, like changing up how things used to be done, maybe when you were collecting data through WISE, adding our state opioid response requirements on top of that. Um, but everybody has been so flexible and adaptable at every level of this work. Um, it's, it's just fallen into place really easily. So we're also providing some mini grants to providers to implement, which is really helping buy-in and capacity. Um, the team implemented a mentorship program for maybe some of our prevention providers who are not as well versed in working with older adults. Uh, so that's been really helpful because I think we get so used to focusing on young people. We don't feel like we have maybe have the skill set to work with older adults, but we really do. It's just reframing like Chuck shared in the beginning. Um, some of those things we already know um, can really be impactful. So we have, you know, that mentorship piece has been really great. Uh, the team has also developed uh, toolkits to all participants with specific resources for the LGBTQ plus populations. And we're also venturing into working with some of our deaf and hard of hearing organizations around the state to provide this as well. Um, some lessons learned is really finding the right balance of people and ensuring you have the right partners at the table um, to guide the work. There were some folks we found that you know we needed in the beginning. Um, so be, really be thoughtful and think about who those key partners are and those non-traditional partners that can help you plan and implement this work. Um, and just being flexible and adaptable. You know, we've requested a lot of different things from the folks, the developers at WISE, and they have been great, but things take time. Um, so we just have to continue to be mindful of that, patient with that, uh, and know that trust the process, as we say, when we use this fifth here, uh, and it always works out. And it, this has been, I can't speak enough about the WISE program and the work that's happening. Um, and we really hope to continue to follow along New York's work, build out our data collection and share some of those same types of um, outcomes that they shared moving forward. Um, so with that, Chuck, I think I can pass it on to Greg. You can. We can go directly to Greg. So thank you, Valerie. Great. Again, thank participants, you. Participants, take a moment. Uh, post questions in the Q&A pod for, for Valerie. Uh, so when we get to that Q&A, we'll bring those questions up. And without further ado, we're turning it over to Greg. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank both of my colleagues just for, you know, 
talking about the WISE programs in their states. Um, here in Indiana, uh, we are utilizing WISE throughout the state. Um, and I, I would dare to say that we've probably reached um, at least 500 folks this year. Uh, but I can only specifically talk about what we're doing uh, at IU Health. And so uh, the Division of Mental Health and Addiction, DMHA, reached out to us here at IU Health to implement a couple of strategies, one being WISE uh, for the 50 plus population. And what we were doing previously is we were partnering with congregations um, to address social isolation. And this all came about uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we found out that uh, statistics was telling us that social people were socially isolated because of the pandemic, not being able to get out and um, just be around other folks. Uh, because of the spread of uh, of um, because the, of the spread of the pandemic during the spread of uh, COVID nineteen, excuse me, and so uh, we wanted to address socially isolated folks. Uh, but what we found out in addressing socially isolated folks was that social isolation, as stated previously, can lead to depression. Depression leads to increased substance misuse, and so. Uh, Again, DMHA approached us because they knew the program that we had already implemented in social isolation uh, to implement WISE as one of the strategies and substance-free alternative events as another one. Let's talk briefly about WISE. So uh, building the capacity and partnering with folks was difficult at, fir at first. Um, we found ourselves initially trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. We cannot... Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, we found ourselves trying to fit a square peg into a round hole uh, versus uh, looking at what we do well and trying to um, implement it as far as uh, implement evidence-based programs. And that didn't work for us well. Uh, so we had to go back. Um, and, and look at the evidence-based programs and how they could best be implemented in our community. And of course, we did a community needs assessment. And upon completion of the community needs assessment, we targeted two counties. We are currently working in nine different counties for social isolation in central Indiana, but we targeted two counties specifically, Marion County, where Indianapolis is located, which is the largest metropolitan area in the state of Indiana, and then a more rural county, which is south of Indianapolis, um, Morgan County. Uh, population of Morgan County is right around 50,000. The population of Marion County is somewhere in the 900 to a million uh, category. And uh, so we implemented WISE. Um, and like my colleagues in both New York and Ohio, people love WISE. Uh, the, the biggest uh, issue that we were having initially was getting the word out. Uh, about WISE and how WISE could address some of the needs in the different communities. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, of course, the goal with WISE was to improve uh, psychological well being, increase knowledge about the ability of the body to metabolize alcohol as we age, and increase the frequency in which participants engage in healthy lifestyle choices. All of those things, um, we found that uh, uh, as we partner with our congregations, um, they were needed, uh, this needed information um, for them, not only for their particular, not only for the, their particular congregants, but also for the community that surrounded their, excuse me, that surrounded their congregations. Uh, what we also found, we had the difficulty recruiting people. Again, once we recruited people to attend the events, they loved it. Uh, the information uh, was well received. The facilitators were learning uh, as they uh, facilitated the classes. But we were having issues um, just getting participation. Um, so we began to speak with other of our colleagues statewide and found out another strategy that they were implementing, which is uh, substance-free alternative events. And substance-free alternative events were simply events um, where we would hold that were alcohol, drug, and substance-free 
uh, where people could gather. You know, let's get out of this mode of being socially isolated. And let's come together as a community, uh, you know, putting aside our differences and just have some nice, clean fun. And what we found out is that instead of trying to fit a square pig in a round hole, that congregations uh, do that well. They know how to have fun without uh, introducing substances, tobacco and alcohol uh, into the equation. And so uh, we began having events like chair yoga, uh, line dancing, game nights, sneaker balls, as I heard one of my colleagues uh, talk about a prom or so we just called them sneaker balls where people just dressed up with their tennis shoes and came out and uh, and enjoyed themselves. And at all of these substance free alternative events, we would have a list to recruit wise participants. OK, we've had three thus far this year, uh, in the first three months, the first quarter of 2024. Uh, at the substance free alternative events, we've had probably around the three that we've had so far, we've probably had around 100 participants. And out of those 100 participants, we've probably had between 25 and 50 that actually signed up for the WISE classes once we uh, disseminated that information at the substance free alternative events. Um, next slide, please. So the lessons that we learned, barriers and facilitators, initial participation, uh, uh, was the, the main barrier that we encountered. Uh, just getting the word out and getting people to uh, learn about WISE and, and what it all entails. One of the reasons we had that barrier is because we're the largest, uh, we're the largest health institution in the state of Indiana. And uh, we kind of had a short timeline, but everything that we do as far as public relations has to be approved. And so we found that as a, a, a great barrier. Uh, but also once we were able to uh, use, utilize the substance free alternative events to help us recruit folks, uh, then uh, we've kind of, you know, found a, um, an answer for that. Uh, technology was another one. We initially were trying to do because of, of the pandemic and COVID-19 social isolation, we were trying to do um, a lot of virtual uh, lessons and that did not work as well in rural areas because uh, the bandwidth wasn't great enough for us uh, to have uh, a meaningful trainings virtually. Again, um, What's helping us with that, a facilitator is, again, promoting these events, WISE trainings at our substance free alternative event. So, and then the whole rural versus urban um, was a barrier. And in some ways it was a facilitator because uh, in, in, the, in the urban areas, uh, the barrier was that there were so many more people um, that were less likely uh, feeling comfortable initially uh, with gathering in large groups, where in the rural areas, they were just looking forward to it. They were ready to get out of the house and gather and do whatever they needed to do, whether it be wear a mask or, or however they were trying to protect themselves. Uh, the lessons that we learned, people like gifts, especially older adults. Uh, so we begin offering incentives, participation, incentives, not only to our participants, but our partnering congregations. Uh, we, we, uh, we would give them a facilities fee to host the trainings. Cause again, one of our barriers was the technology. And so we, we figured out that in person would do a lot better. So we began to offer our partner organizations incentives. We also offer incentives to participants, gift cards, pens, tote bags, hand, sanit hand sanitizer, et cetera, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, then we began also to partner with people outside of congregation. Uh, again, we have to build capacity and we have to promote sustainability. And so in building the capacity, we reached out to senior housing and community centers who were uh, just elated and excited about hosting our WISE trainings and our substance-free alternative events. You know, just because you're 50 plus, as we've learned earlier, doesn't mean uh, that we still don't like to have fun and get out and dance and do things in the community. Um, 
And then finally, again, we learned that we needed to recruit uh, participants at both of our strategies. Uh, at Substance Free Alternative events, we recruit WISE participants and at WISE classes, we uh, recruit participants for our Substance Free Alternative events. So that pretty much wraps it up for us. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Greg, again, for uh, an, an amazing presentation. Again, a, a different take, a different avenue for getting started and a way of doing this work. Um, so this is our Q&A point. I'm going to start with the questions that are in the pod. Um, so again, it looks like we have lots of questions. Some of them um, will we'll, uh, attempt to figure out who's best to answer or if, or if it's generally to the whole group. Um, the first question uh, from a participant, what do you feel is the most effective way to combat loneliness in seniors, especially if they're reluctant to open up after months of trying to develop connectedness? So some thoughts about loneliness. Um, so this looks like it could be any or uh, all of you all. Um, so it, any of you have an initial response to thinking about the issue of, of loneliness and connectedness and some thoughts about, about how to work with that? Um, I think that's the beauty of the WISE program. Um, it it um, really brings people together. Um, and um, we have found that um, relationships that weren't um, within a senior housing program or um, a food program were developed during this time together. Um, and having that opportunity um, to build those parts from, from our WISE program, similar to what Valerie and Greg had mentioned, we've had people starting walking groups where they're getting together on a regular basis. Um, they're meeting for coffee. They want to do the WISE program again. They're doing lunch groups. So um, I really think that has been um, a positive about this program. And Valerie, then Greg, any additional thoughts you would add to thoughts about dealing with loneliness? I echo Patricia and, you know, think about the relationships that are built and slowly built and it takes time and building that trust um, and the program and our facilitators help make that happen. Um, but it, it, it can take time um, and that's okay as long as we're or keep moving forward and getting in there and providing those opportunities. So yeah, I agree with Patricia hundred percent. And I too agree with both of my colleagues. I, I just think that the WISE uh, classes and also the substance free alternative events uh, kind of stimulate what had been lost uh, a little bit uh, during the pandemic. And especially as we age, sometimes we have a tendency to be more isolated. Uh, one of the offshoots of one of the wise uh, trainings that we had was uh, the ladies in the group. They formed a little group where they would just a different bus line every uh, once a week and they would ride it to the end and then ride it back home. And as they were on the bus line, they would basically be advertising for the program and just talking to people. And that, you know, just it's meaning making uh, in action. Awesome. Thank you, panel members. A, a question specifically for Patricia. Uh, did you work with WISE developers uh, to, to address the diversity of population? Um, we have been working with the, the WISE developers, as uh, my colleagues um, at Ohio have. We've kind of tag team the WISE developers, um, which is the Prevention Council of New Jersey. Um, I think a challenge for them has been bandwidth and what they have available as staff and funding to do things like translation. So we are working closely um, with them to talk about how do we do a TOT? Um, how do we get um, translation available? So that's something we have been working on. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, any of you folks uh, on the panel, uh, can we say more about what, what's been your experience with binge drinking in this population? What, what are you seeing? How does it come up? 
Um, you know, how do, how do you do that warm handoff to, to thinking about uh, a brief intervention of some kind? So say a little bit more about what are you seeing with binge drinking and what are you doing? Yes, I'll get that's I think go ahead, Valerie. No, you start. No, I was gonna say I don't know that I can speak to that level of what our partners are seeing locally in this space, but I know we're looking at other programs that we have, such as minimize risk, maximize maximize life, and how we can infuse some of that low risk drinking guidelines. Um in the settings. So I don't have that local view right now. Um, like I wish I did, but I could connect folks to that. Patricia. Yeah. And um, again, our work is around talking about binge drinking has been in the space of our coalition work. Um, and as you know, uh, working with coalitions, you're looking at local data. So they're working um, with their 12 sectors to sit at the table and say, what are you seeing in your hospital system? What are you seeing in your emergency rooms? So we're um, it's a challenge. Um, to get that data um, and to um, to really um, get an understanding, but it's something we're working on. Um, you know, like most of you that are in the prevention field, um, you know, this is a new space across the lifespan for us. So, um, you know, as some of part of it is learning as we go and and finding places where we can get the data that we need. Um, in terms of expert. Um, we have had success with warm handoff to our prevent or to our treatment system. Um, and I have to say that um, anecdotally, we've heard of situations where individuals who are in recovery and may have relapsed because they were in the WISE program um, went to the facilitator at the end of the program and said, I need to get reconnected with services. Um, we've had family members say, I have a, a child um, or a family member who needs services and made that connection, provide Narcan to individuals. So um, I think there's been a lot of benefits. Awesome, thank you all again for, for that answer. Uh, a lot of interest in the chat, in the Q&A about attendance and, and how successful all three of you have been at, at sort of both attracting people and keeping people involved. Um, can you say anything else? What's the secret sauce to getting people in your program and, and keeping attendance as high as you've been able to? I can take zero credit for any of that. That is the power of our facilitators and folks like Greg who are working in the community, building those relationships um, and not giving up. Um, these are really passionate people in this space as we know most preventionists are. Uh, so I don't know if there's a, a secret, but I think even if you have a group of three and you present this program to, I think others are going to see it and want it. And, and that just, it just kind of grows from there. I think the, the, the benefit of partnering with our state department of health and veterans affairs has been amazing. Um, they did a whole webinar with us talking about the program before we found the volunteer counties. <clears throat> so that has really been um, a partnership that we benefited from. I would recommend partnership, 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 mm. build it and they will come. Awesome. I Interesting comment in, in the Q&A about sort of thinking about what we understand as occupational therapists, for example, about dimensions of wellness. And so for some of us being familiar with, with the eight dimensions of wellness or other ways to think about wellness, um, how does that come up in WISE in terms of thinking about the different ways uh, or dimensions of wellness and how, how does wellness show up in there um, with, with some specificity about different ways. I'm, I'm guessing, for example, Greg, is, is the issue of spirituality at, at all woven in, given that you're working through congregations? Well, yes, I would say that spirituality is woven into all of this as far as in the wise training. Uh, but I also uh, have to say that we take a holistic approach. Uh, when we talk about spirituality, we talk about health, uh, we talk about healthy living and healthy lifestyle choices. And 
one of the things that that uh, came up in one of the wise trainings was people said that we can't exercise. I'm not physically able uh, to exercise. And so I shared a story that had occurred in one of our classes that a gentleman shared. And he said that he doesn't exercise as far as go to a gym or anything like that. But every time a commercial comes on when he's watching TV, he does 10 push-ups or as many as he can. Uh, another, uh, another one of the ladies shared that she has free weights and and she does five pound curls as she's watching her soap operas. So, I mean, there's ways um, for us to incorporate whatever we decide that we want to do into the things that we're already doing. Uh, and it's all, it's all part of the, you know, the wise teaching of the healthy lifestyle choices. It's a choice and you can make it. Awesome. Um, lots of interest in facilitators and master trainers. How do you get them? What's that training look like? Um, are, are they compensated? Um, so say a little bit about your facilitators and master trainers. How does that work? I think well, it's great to connect with the team at New Jersey Prevention Network to get all the, the ins and outs of that. Um, you know, we've done application processes, you know, we want criteria, kind of some experience folks have in different spaces. We didn't always just look for people who are experienced in prevention, which is typically how we approach things. Um, but we wanted to look outside of that and bring folks into prevention too, that maybe have a skill set um, that would really elevate the work. Um, but the WISE website, the website has a lot of great information on. I know that's going to be shared out with everybody. So you can contact them. You can look at the curriculum um, and the, those key components of the program. Um, but I would definitely, for more, follow up with that group. They're, they're, they're great to work with. We used our prevention system. We have 145 funded prevention programs across New York State. Um, and what we did was we paired with those counties and those communities that really wanted to be a part of the project, which gave us a head, a head start, I will say. But our prevention providers who do various curriculum programs, um, this was another tool in their toolkit. Um, and they've really, as I said, taken off and built partnerships that we never anticipated. And awesome. our Perfect. facilitators were all trained through New Jersey Prevention Network. So uh, that's a great resource. So leverage, leverage program developers there for that question. Uh, a number of other questions about the program can also be answered through that website in terms of uh, getting participants, how many participants, the, 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 the length of sessions, those kinds of things are all there. I want to thank our, our panel members today. And it's a good segue from partnerships into uh, moving into, into wrapping up and inviting again, some, some final thoughts, um, sort of thinking about that integrative network uh, of ways of creating and enhancing uh, the number of partnerships has come up so many times in this last hour and a half, um, thinking about a, an assessment of the needs of folks where you live by thinking about barriers and facilitators, continue to address risk and protective factors as well as psychosocial stuff. Uh, and again, thinking more about making it easier, making it affordable, um, using communication networks that they're familiar with, getting the word out through through those mechanisms. Um, I love the idea of sort of uh, using, as Greg talked about, getting out for one activity and using that activity to feed the other program. Uh, uh, lots of tremendously great ideas about how to create that supportive network um, in throughout the process. You've heard folks talk about a variety of partners, including housing and health centers, uh, state and city departments on aging has been part of the initial partnerships. I heard a number of our panel members talk about um, senior services or centers, primary care, specialized workers who work with, with uh, folks in this population, associations, area associations on aging, lots of ideas for partners and the importance of not trying to do this on your own in terms of being able to have both the connection and the reach uh, to do this work. Sounds like partners are, are not just a luxury, but 
really critical uh, in this work. And then finally, finding some evidence-based programs as, as being a little bit challenging in, in the old days is when we went to national registries and we could filter. Um, there's still that, that ability to do that with some registries out there you can still look at uh, and filter for this population. I think that, that as useful are to think about specialized registries like the National Council on Aging, ncoa.org has evidence-based program registry. Um, they also have a catalog that just features descriptions of programs that, that have been tested, shown to be effective with, with older adults. Um, the Administration for Community Living also has uh, a, a, a great site to be able to look at uh, programs, uh, specifically evidence-based programs. Um, use the registry guide that's been published again through the PTTC that lists a whole host of online registries. Um, many of them, without going into detail about which ones, um, are, are great in terms of the ability to filter for older adults. Some of them you can filter for other kinds of issues. So um, programs like uh, What Works on, on the National Registry and Roadmaps um, through um, through the, the Wisconsin group uh, also allows you to filter by specific issues like building social and community capital, uh, increasing community connectedness. So you can search in some cases by so psychosocial factors. Um, so thinking about registries in different ways, looking at state and federal websites, using organizations uh, that focus on that way. So lots of links uh, showing up in your chat right now about how to find those registries and catalogs. And that information again will come out with this um, as well. We've taken a Q&A, so I wanna, again, without further ado, turn this back over to, uh, to, to the chess folks, back to, uh, to Chris Gabrielson, who's gonna bring us home. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, a uh, huge thank you to Chuck for pulling this together, as well as for the panelists who shared such great information during today's session. And of course, to you all for your active participation and for being here to learn about this important topic. So I wanted to share a couple of things with you. Um, this was a joint effort between the Great Lakes PTTC as well as the Northwest PTTC. So I'm gonna share some events that the Great Lakes are gonna offer. And then I will, on the next slide, our events that the Northwest PTTC is going to offer. So a few things coming up with um, the Great Lakes region. And if you're outside our region, you are welcome to uh, participate in these as well. We have the fifth and sixth sessions of our deep dive into prevention ethics that folks are welcome to join. You don't have to have attended the previous ones in order to join in. These are interactive trainings where um, you will go into breakout rooms. So just a warning, if you don't like breakout rooms, you might not want to sign up for this, but uh, we've had fantastic participation and people have really enjoyed these trainings. So encourage you to join us. We also have a webinar on working within rural communities. So if you work with rural communities and want to explore this more of how to best do that as a prevention professional, that's on May 16th. We have project management skills for substance misuse prevention practitioners on May 30th. That's a, a three hour training. So again, that's an interactive training where you'll be put into breakout rooms, um, really, really do skill building uh, activities during that session. Prevention in the time of changing cannabis policies. This is Jason Kilmer. That's going to be on June 4th. Many of you may have seen him speak before. He's fantastic. Um, always has great information and delivers it really well. So I encourage you to, to join us on June 4th. We have a media literacy webinar on what, uh, June 20th. Um, we already have close to 400 signed up for that. So that's going to be a really a nice size group for that one. Um, we have another one that we are jointly putting together with the Pacific Southwest PTTC, and that's Social Determinants of Health and Primary Prevention. Uh, registration is not quite open for that yet, but probably will be within the next two weeks. Um, that's with Nicole Augustine. And finally, I encourage everybody to attend this training on using storytelling techniques to create highly engaging and impactful presentations. This is Brian Kloss with Johns Hopkins is delivering the training. He just delivered a training for us on using AI in prevention, and it was fantastic. And this is uh, this training on June 27th is um, for anybody who delivers presentations in any way. So if you deliver presentations to your community coalition, to older adults within your community, or you uh, do trainings, you know, statewide, regional wide, nationally, any any level, um, this information can apply to you. 
Northwest PTTC is offering some fantastic things coming up on May 9th. It's going to be the third webinar in their series on uh, prevention across the lifespan, and that one's going to be on substance use prevention among midlife adults. And then on uh, from May 17th to the 19th, they're going to do an in-person event, which is fantastic. Uh, it's for prevention professionals. Uh, it's a prevention professional strategic planning retreat. And that is just for folks in the Northwest region. And finally, they are offering a weaving wisdom with innovation, timeless indigenous strategies for contemporary substance use disorder, which sounds fantastic. And that's going to be on May 21st. If you haven't already, I encourage you to follow both of our regional PTTCs on Facebook. You see the, the uh, links there or the what you can put in, in your, as you search for us on Facebook right there. Um, and then the Great Lakes PTTC also has a LinkedIn page. So if you are a LinkedIn type of person, we hope you, to follow, you will follow us on there. And last but not least, as Rebecca mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we encourage you to complete the evaluation form that you'll be redirected to at the end as the webinar closes out. Um, we absolutely read through all of these, all of the responses you give us. So please know it doesn't go into a black hole. We read it, we absorb it, and we apply the, <clears throat> the information that you give to us for our future offerings. So please take some time to do that. And with that, I am going to check back in with Rebecca and any of the other presenters for any last um, comments before we close this out. I want to take again the opportunity to thank you to, to, to Pat, Greg, and Valerie. Amazing job to our panelists. Uh, terrific information. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And Rebecca, any last logistics? Just the last thing I want to say is I will be sending out an email follow up with all of these links and um, information on how to reach people and um, you will all have that in your inbox shortly. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care.